This is a real preserved human brain. If Betty sat in my head, she would sit just like this. Dr. Wendy Suzuki is a world-renowned neuroscientist, professor at New York University, and a best-selling author. With over two decades of groundbreaking research, her work gives women practical tools that help navigate life's transitions like perimenopause and menopause. Thank you for bringing your brain. You're welcome. <laughs> welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here. What initially drew you to study the brain? It was an incredible mentor that I had that I met my very first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley. And um, go Bears, I went to Berkeley. Oh, really? Oh, my <laughs> gosh, that's so great. So maybe you knew her. Uh, she was a legend on campus. Her name was Marion Diamond, and mm -hmm. she was a professor of neuro mm -hmm. neuroanatomy. And I took her first year seminar class called The Brain and Its Potential. And of course, I didn't know who she was. I just thought, ooh, the brain, that sounds interesting. And so I walk into this class classroom and I see, I kid you not, a Beyonce-like figure at the front of the classroom. To this day, I think of her as like the Beyonce of neuroscientists. Wow. And um, she started talking to us about how incredible the human brain was. And um, on the desk in front of her, she had this hat box. And with her gloved hand, hands, she slowly and dramatically opened that hat box and pulled out a real preserved human brain to us first year students <laughs> with our mouths agape. And um, it was just the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. Wow. And uh, it got me hooked on neuroscience and wanting to study the brain. You brought your brain with, with you. I brought my brain with me. <laughs> Not just the one in your head. Not just the one in my head. I brought in a separate oh one. Oh my. That is incredible. This is Betty. She lives wow. in my lab. Wow. At Four Washington Place. Wow. That's incredible. This is a real preserved human brain. That's incredible. If Betty sat in my head, she would sit just like this. This is the frontal lobe right behind my forehead. And this is where that focus and attention that sometimes wanes in menopause, it's uh, dependent on exactly this part of the brain right here. But to give a quick tour, this is the occipital lobe right in the back of the head. This is primary visual cortex where all visual processing happens. If you damage your eyes, you're blind. But if your eyes were working just fine, but this part of the brain was damaged, you would be functionally blind. You would not be able to see. If I flip this over, this is the bottom of what's called the temporal lobe and below um, the cortex, the outer covering of the brain, is a um, seahorse-shaped structure on this side and on this side called the hippocampus. And that is a structure where shiny new hippocampal cells grow if you move your body. And it's also the structure that is attacked earliest in Alzheimer's dementia. So that is a, a, a quick walkthrough of that's incredible. This brain. Thank you for bringing your brain. You're welcome. That's very exciting. <laughs> for a long time, the hormonal shifts across a woman's life, like puberty, pregnancy, mm -hmm. perimenopause, menopause, were framed squarely around how they impact reproductive health. Of course, we know these impact the entire body. Can you speak to how hormonal shifts, specifically those associated with menopause, affect brain health? Sure. I mean, uh, I think any woman of that age will be able to tell you that focus can can change um, um, <laughs> the hot sweats going through the body is affecting your everyday um, your everyday ability to do your job and to, to really focus. And this really spoke to me because as I was going through menopause, I was studying the effects of physical activity on the brain, which immediately boosts your mood, it boosts your focus. And so I naturally 
started to try and use physical activity to affect these brain-centered kind of uh, effects that are very, very common in menopause. And it really, really helped. And um, this is something that could help not just me, but so many millions of women that are going through this. Many women talk about brain fog during perimenopause and menopause. Yeah. What's actually uh, happening in the brain during this transition? It's actually unclear exactly what's going on. The the physical manifestation is brain fog. But what I can tell you about is what different activities can do to, to release that brain fog. And so I'm going to start with something that I've studied for so many years in my lab, just mentioned it, physical activity. So physical activity gives your brain what I like to call a bubble bath of neurochemicals. It releases a whole bunches of neurochemicals, and you've heard of some of them, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, endorphins, uh, and especially dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that the prefrontal cortex uses, the seed of focus in your brain. Increasing that dopamine is a great way to improve your focus. So that is what we know from many, many studies. A single bout of physical activity can not for the rest of your life, but temporarily boost your focus. So clear way to do that. Meditation and those kinds of practices are also something using a different mechanism that we're not as clear about to improve your focus. In your book, Good Anxiety, you describe anxiety as a resource rather than an obstacle. How might women in perimenopause and menopause use this framework to better manage the shifts that often accompany hormonal changes? Yeah, yeah. So um, I like to call anxiety a gift that we have or a superpower, which I know is hard to <laughs> take in when so many suffer from the real effects of anxiety. But I think it's important to understand that for everybody, men, women, whatever age, anxiety is a normal human emotion that is protective. You have anxiety to protect yourself from life and the things and the dangers in life. And so the, the, the core of my book, Good Anxiety, is can we take advantage of the core of that emotion to say, hey, how can I use my own anxiety to protect myself and give myself benefits that we're not thinking about because we kind of sit back and say, oh, God, you know, I'm just overwhelmed by this feeling of anxiety. Instead of saying, hey, you know, I am, this anxiety is warning me about certain things and it is giving me a uh, preview of what I should be uh, focused on and taking care of. If you use it in that way, that can be a real game changer for how you use anxiety in your whole life, irrespective of your age. Yeah. And you talk about the sort of negativity bias. Yes. Um, which, you know, our, our our brains are sort of hardwired in some ways to sort of seek out worst case scenario. Yes. And that's a survival mechanism. Yes. Yes. How do you how do you short circuit that tendency? One negative word can have an overblown effect on a conversation compared to a similar kind of positive notion because we are all wary of those negative kinds of warnings in, in our life. So how do you counter that? Well, first thing that I do as a neuroscientist is I turn to how fear is processed in the brain. It's processed by a structure called the amygdala. And um, the amygdala is there, again, to protect us, and it helps us um, create very, very strong, long-lasting memories of those very, very dangerous situations. You got mugged, you, your house was broken into, those memories last for a very, very long time so that you are protected against you know, getting yourself into that same situation. You have a great birthday party, and you know those memories kind of fade if you don't do other things. So here's the other things that you can do to counteract that bias and focus yourself more on positive memories. It seems so obvious when you say it, but think about the beautiful, positive, hilarious, joyful events in your life. It's a little bit like you're training a muscle exactly. to hold on to the positive. Yes. And what there must be a kind of neurological signature to that. The more you have those memories, Absolutely. the more the, those pathways yes. get reinforced. Exactly. So they're strengthened 
little by little in this hippocampal pathway, but they can be strengthened. So the trick, the neuroscientific trick, is you just have to repeat them, bring them up in your memory more and more. What is that going to do? It's going to give you a life that where you're walking down the street instead of thinking about the terrible five things that you haven't done yet. You're thinking about the best conversations that you've had with your family. Uh, you talk about the relationship between resilience and anxiety, which mm. I, I love how you explain this, how anxiety can weaken resilience and our ability to weather life storms, but also how, how anxiety can help build our resilience stores. How does this work? Yeah, um, everybody has anxiety. And part of the tools that I give in this book, Good Anxiety, are all the uh, neuroscience and psycho psychological tools to turn the volume down so that you can step back once the volume is turned down a little bit through exercise, through meditation, lots of different different tools, through bringing back memories of, of, of lovely activities. All of those are tools in, in the book. You can step back and ask yourself, what is my anxiety telling me about not what's terrible in my life, but what I hold dear. Because on the flip side of your anxiety is something that you cherish. Mm -hmm. So let's take one that everybody has, anxiety over money. It's like you almost don't wanna bring it up because it's a little bit embarrassing. But what that really shows uh, is that you have a, a love of security. You value security. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course you value security. It's the most basic of human It's the most emotions, basic in yes. everybody. That's why everybody has anxiety over money. <laughs> but you could also bond over that, that love of security. And focusing on that is the key to help that resilience grow, realizing there's a flip side to your anxiety. And it shows you beautiful things about yourself. What are the most important early warning signs women should pay attention to when it comes to long-term brain health. Ask yourself what is in your life right now that we know is so good for your brain. And because we were just talking about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with social interaction. One of the most important things uh, that we as humans, social, socially evolved animals, need in our lives. Mm -hmm. Hobbies are coming back with a force. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we need things to really improve our, our stress management. That is, why is that? Loneliness is on the rise. Sleep, so important. Ask yourself, how is your sleep? Are you still in that college or early you know, professional life where you are sacrificing your sleep to get that extra hour of work? Not a good thing for anybody. I don't care whether you're in high school or college. And nutrition, of course, good for your body, good for your brain. So I always start there. The most common form of neurodegenerative disease is Alzheimer's, which is a form of dementia. And the earliest typical sign of dementia is memory loss because the first structure that is attacked in dementia, in Alzheimer's dementia, is a structure called the hippocampus. So critical for those kinds of memories that we we're talking about, the who, what, where, when, how memories called episodic memories are dependent on the hippocampus. And those are the cells that start to die in, in, um, in early dementia. And there are things that you can do to strengthen the hippocampus. Yes, and that is that can happen when you're worried about memory or today. And so the most transformative thing that everybody can do to strengthen their hippocampus is move their body more. Because exercise releases not just those neurochemical bubble baths of dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, but growth factors as well. You want what I like to call a big, fat, fluffy hippocampus. Go out and move your body more. It's as simple as that. Great. Um, and what about uh, weight training? Here's what we know. The science tells us that aerobic exercise is good. And everybody is, is um, understandably very interested in their own favorite form of workout. I personally love cardio weights because it gets me the cardio that I know has the most evidence to benefit my brain. But I also know as, as a woman uh, at my age, I need weight bearing exercises. And guess what? Cardio weights gets my heart rate up even higher than I would if I didn't use those weights. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. This was so incredibly informative. You're and so welcome. Inspiring. Thank you.